Welcome, Flipboard fam. This is your favorite coach, Coach Jeffrey. And I have a... Oh, let me add my... I got my audio on. Let me turn on my audio player. Waiting on my man, Casey, to get back. Uh, trying out some new software. Uh, you might see that it looks a little different over here. We are working with Restream IO. Uh, they will be assisting me with my new streaming platform. So we'll see um, how this works out for all of those who uh, are paying attention to the show. So this is a little bit different, a uh, little different look. Um, we'll be customized a little bit later, working on that customization. But I'm just trying this platform out. This is Restream IO. And I have my man Casey, uh, Dr. Casey Jakubowski. Hey, Casey, I'm, I probably did not pronounce your name right. Say your name again for me. Hey, Coach, it's uh, Dr. Casey Jacobowski. Jacobowski, that's right, Casey. So I appreciate yeah. it. Hey, man, I met you a while ago, and uh, I, I remember you were a very lively guy, and I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Well, thank you for having me, Coach Jeffrey. You know, it's an honor and it's a privilege to be on your show be talking about some of the work I wrote about in my edge match book, thinking about teaching, and to uh, be supportive of our amazing colleague, Dr. Sarah Thomas, yeah. who has done yeoman's work. Oh my gosh, she is on fire. Yes, she is. So before you get into that, let me count it down, and then I will get into the show. Is that a deal? That is a deal. Okay, great. So five, four, three, two, one. Welcome back, Fieldboard fam. This is your favorite coach, Coach Jeffrey, and I'm here with Dr. Casey Jacobowski. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Coach Jeffrey. Appreciate it. It's an honor to be here. Great. Hey, Casey, tell our listening audience a little bit about yourself. So I have been involved in education at K-12 and higher ed for over 20 years. I am the author of the Edumatch book, Thinking About Teaching where I talk a lot about my time as an educator. And I'm also a huge fan of research, scholarship, and practitioner efforts on civility and civic education, which we have a lot to talk about in those areas. Yes, uh, I definitely want to get into those questions about that, but let's give uh, credit where credit is due. We have a mutual friend, Dr. Sarah Thomas, right? Oh, my goodness. If you want to support an amazing educator who is top of her field, her game has zero shame. She is on point. Oh, Dr. Sarah is on fire. Yeah, she's amazing. And, you know, it's a couple of people in this world who um, are just like connectors and I appreciate her. So any chance I can give people their flowers, I like to. And Dr. Thomas is an amazing connector of educators. Um, she made it possible for a lot of us to become authors um, simply because she followed her dream. So I appreciate you, Dr. Thomas, um, as I'm moving into my 40. This is going to be my 43rd episode with our homeboy, Dr. Casey. on. so uh, just thank you for, you know, lighting that path for people like myself. Yeah, it's been great, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Sarah did something phenomenal. She said the voice of educators needs to be amplified. 
the voice of the people who are in the classroom, the voice of us who've been in the trenches, those of us who have been on fire, those of us who wake up in 3 a.m. if it's Eastern Standard Time or if it's earlier, <laughs> depending upon where you are, yeah. and thinking, how am I going to get to my students tomorrow? How am I going to get through everything I need to get through from the child in the front to the child in the back, from the child on the left to the child on the right? And Dr. Sarah gave us that chance to have our voices amplified. Yes, certainly appreciate you. So, uh, Dr. Jacobowski, uh, you say in your book, Thinking About Teaching, uh, what made you write this book? Well, you know, Coach, it's really interesting. It started as a way for me to reflect on a career that began back in 1998 as I graduated from the State University of New York, Fredonia, Go Blue Devils. And I started as an educator looking to make history more engaging. Too often it was names, it was dates, it was factoids. But I thought there's a story there, there's power, there's passion. There needs to be a way to do it better. And after almost 20 years of my career, you know what I realized? I realized that we've got to think about what we do day in and day out. We have to think about what inspired us, what motivates us, what gets us to stop and think about the day-to-day -day life. And I realized, and I tried to communicate to people in my book, how on the 4th of July, if you listen to Neil Diamond's song, Coming to America, depending upon who you are and your background, it really has so many layers to it. And I feel like just stopping for a minute and as a society listening to that song where it starts far, they've been traveling far. And if you think about it, all of our ancestors, whether voluntarily or involuntarily brought to this country, came here and they had to create a new life. And I think it's really critically important for us to think about that, that voluntarily or involuntarily, we've all got to work together. And so I also took the lens of thinking about not only we need to do a better job of talking about our commonalities, but we also need to communicate together about what challenges us. And, you know, Coach, I remember one of the greatest points a scout leader said to me when I was in scouts earning my Eagle Scout. They said, it's not if you fall down, but it's if you don't get back up. And I think that that's such a critical point that we all have to remember is that we need each other to help get back up. We need each other to help realize, and I talk about this in my book, the best lesson I ever had, the worst lesson I ever had, and why I left. And I want others to know that it's okay to have those dark, dark, dark thoughts at 3 a.m. But dang it, you got to be there and you've got to reach out a hand and say, come along, I'm going to help you up the mountain too. Man, you said a lot. Um, and my question is, is that in COVID-19 era, we have experienced a lot, um, some very different things um, this year. So within thinking about teaching, how does that relate to what we're experiencing in the COVID-19 era? Well, for one thing, if you are an educator at whatever level and you have not refocused and reverbed onto humanity, what the heck are you doing? Seriously, if your students are not safe, if your students are not getting fed, if your students are worried about grandma, grandpa, mom, dad, their aunt, their uncle, their cousins, if they're worried about their little brothers or sisters, if they're not safe, Maslow tells you that if they're at the bottom of the pyramid, there is no way, unless you do Maslow, you are ever going to get to any of the theories on pedagogy. And COVID-19 reinforced this so much to me, Coach, We've seen so many people out there trying to march us along like it's normal, but there's nothing normal about 2020 and 2021. I mean, my goodness, we had on January 6th, 2021, 
an attempt to overthrow the United States of America's government. In 2020, we had leaders not being leaders. They were being demagogues. And they were saying, don't listen to this person because they make me look bad. And we have people going, I don't believe in germ theory. I think it's an attempt to control the population. As an educator coach, I think, oh my goodness, what has happened? Because testing's not working. I don't care what the federal government says. Testing is not working, number one. And number two, schools are the most critical points of any community. They keep so many families from starving to death. If you can buy a fifth island, Maybe it's time for you to buy 500,000 people breakfast. And that's what I think we've all learned about COVID-19 and teaching. Wow. Uh, a lot of teachers have struggled uh, this past year. And um, what reflections can your book, what is a point from your book that we can apply to COVID-19? Some of those teachers who are struggling because there, there are a lot. Yeah. I, I, I think first and foremost, Coach, one of the points that is beyond just COVID-19, but it, it I think, and maybe this is just me selfishly talking about it as an author and the person who's reflecting on this, is that it's okay to struggle. It's okay to ask for help. But one of the points you have to do is you have to get back to your why. You have to get back to why you went into the profession. Now, I have not had a summer off in my entire life. So let's just kick that narrative that teachers get the summer off out. No, teachers are not paid in the summer because we're doing all this other work. I think the second point that teachers need to realize, and this is something that I talk about in my book, and I think that it's really critically important here, is I, I say so in my second chapter. Build ties with your students. Always be there for your students. One of the proudest things I can tell you is when I get an unsolicited Facebook or LinkedIn or one of those other social media platform invites from a former student and they'll say unbidden, unsolicited, hey, Casey, hey, Mr. J, hey, Dr. J, because I did that too. I got a doctor at Holy Smokes. They'll say, hey, Dr. J, thank you for caring more about us than about the test scores. You know, and then also, so here's another issue that is uh, facing a lot of us. Uh, standardized testing is how we maintain our jobs. And in your book, you talked about um, thinking about teaching, but how does standardized testing actually play uh, a role for people who are required to go by that standardized tested model? You know, I struggle with this quite a bit, Coach, because I think one of the critical things that teachers, educators need to think about is testing will only give you a small piece of data. You've got to have the overall view of the student, the whole student. But there are ways to co-op that data. There are ways to utilize that data to improve your own teaching. And... Uh, the regents exam in New York State are very scary for a lot of students because they're end of the term and it determines whether or not they graduate. I instead thought that the regents exams could be used as a good way to challenge my students to think creatively. And I used to say, you know what? This is like track hurdles, something to get over, but it's not a tall, high jump that you need a pole. Rather, it's a very short, little device that gets in your way. Think of it as a tripping hazard and not as a ceiling. And I also said the second point to this is use that data to demonstrate where you as a professional need to grow. If all my students miss all the multiple choice questions on China on the Regents exam, or they miss totally construe how to do a document-based essay question, that's on me as the adult to go back and reflect on my education. That's on me to go back to reflect on my pedagogy. That's on me to go back and reflect on my craft. 
Now where I really have a tough time with those standardized testing is where it's almost like the tortoise and the hare in their race. They don't give the tortoise the opportunity to beat the hare. They keep throwing quicksand underneath the tortoise. So even if the students are going slow and steady, they're, sh they're, they're constantly, constantly being pulled and in, sucked into that swamp of that quicksand. So instead, what I argue is that until we have good dune buggies, good swamp buggies, good wooden bridges for students to walk upon, those tests are never going to be fair. So <laughs> I have to, I have to say this about standardized testing. Um, people who don't understand that testing is just a dipstick. Um, they take it as this is a projection. Does your book address that, that, that marker? I think you're right. I think it, that's a great way, Coach, to talk about it. It is a dipstick. I'm a type 2 diabetic. I have to test my blood sugar every day. Five fingers. Gotta love it. They hurt. But every couple of months or so, the doctor will do a blood draw, and that's called an A1C. Now, what's the difference between my blood sugar out of my fingers and the blood out of my arm vein, my A1C? The A1C tells a long-term story versus the painful testing, the high-stakes testing that I do daily only tells me if that cupcake should not have been eaten for lunch. Yup, there should not have been a cupcake. But at the same point in time, if I eat salads most of the other time, but my numbers across the board are still cupcake level, Maybe it's time for some assistance. Maybe it's time for some medication. Maybe it's time for, come on, Casey, you're a lineman. Get out there and run. Start trying to be like a wide receiver and not like a linebacker, man. <laughs> and you know this, Coach, because I played, I played bench warmer, okay? I am good at keeping a bench in one place. But, man, you know. And, and, you know, I think what the students want to see, and I think what we really have to do is we have to stop the politics of testing. Mm -hmm. Because instead of doing what we should be doing, which is saying to students, you're in a school that's not doing you right. Let's get you into a place that does do you right. Testing says to the adult, to the child, to the institution, you're bad. That cannot be anymore. It's got to say, hey, what do we need to do to help you be better? You know, just like anytime you go in for any sort of tests from a medical profession or you go in for a financial test or you go in for a, a uh, other types of test with I'm trying to think of what other areas you go in for tests for. Oh, yeah. You know, whatever you want to do with law. You need to know what you need to know so that you can move forward and do better. Tests in education have become gotcha moments. Yeah, that that is uh, that speaks to me as an administrator simply because um, we never want to look at um, a point in time for someone's um, course or someone's history. I love your diabetes analogy. That's a great analogy. I will definitely use that. And hey, man, I know you also do some consulting work. Yes. Uh, let's talk about some of the consulting work that you do around your book. Yeah. So one of the areas that I, I realized was when I worked at a large division one research institution in the Northeast, I was teaching innovation, entrepreneurship. I was teaching within STEM. And one of the points that I realized is that I'm a creative guy, too. And what I decided to do was create a consulting firm to help people move from OK to outstanding. And so one of the areas that I do is I go in and I help people find their why. I talk to schools. I talk to departments. I talk to businesses. But most importantly, I really, really, really help people who believe... <sighs> I feel stuck. And so I coach them. 
because, you know, one of the areas that we often forget about, and, you know, there's this idea of growth mindset and the idea of grit. But in reality, one of the points that we often forget to mention to people is that you got to have the right tools or you got to have the right motivation to help. So, you know, you and I, athletic people, not going to exactly climb a tree without a little bit of support. But if you give me a belay line and you give me somebody pulling the rope on the other end, right, and you also give me a safety net because I hate heights, I could make it to the top of the tree. But I need that help. And so what I try to do is I try to be very strength-based, coach. I try to say, what are you good at? What are you going to be great at? Let's make that advancement. Because all the research says, if you spend time on your weakness, you can never refine your strength. And I would rather be proficient in one area, really good at one major area, than to try to be great at a few things and mediocre at everything else. If the one point people remember me for is that I will help you realize how awesome you are, and you'll go, wow, I never thought of myself that way. Done my job. Wow, that's amazing. That kind of goes against what happens in education. It seems like in education, we want to refine as many skills as we possibly can. But in most places, you're not allowed to use those skills. So I really appreciate you bringing that out. What made you come to that conclusion? Well, you know, it was something that happened to me <clears throat> as I've been looking at and reading through books because I love to read. And I read a book called Range, and I'm reading another book called The Death of Expertise. And I, know, and I read another book called The Masters of Craft. And in all three of these books, the one thread was this point about focus on what you're really good at. Focus in on enjoying doing a diverse range of points. It doesn't matter if you're phenomenal at them. But just find one or two you're really good at and find a support point. So, for instance, bands. I played the euphonium or the baritone or what other people would consider the my parents couldn't afford to rent the saxophone. So I got the school band music, right? Wasn't great at it. Wasn't phenomenal as it. I would say I wasn't even good at it. You know who's really good? My wife. She's really good at the French horn. But you know what we've all done? We've all fallen out of practice. But to this day, I love listening to good baritone euphonium trombone music. I love listening to my wife's voice when she sings. I love it when I hear French horns. I get riled up when I hear music. And it makes me a better person. And you know what else it does? It makes me realize how big the world is. But dang it, if I hadn't have played that euphonium for five years in elementary, middle, and high school, I wouldn't be a music lover. I wouldn't understand the devotion it takes. Now, don't ask me to draw for you. Please don't ask me to draw for you. <laughs> but I get music. Excellent. Uh, are you still teaching social studies? I'm, I'm doing a really unique joint effort where I teach at a local community college in the Department of Liberal Arts, and I teach a college forum. And this summer, I'm teaching a class in public administration and leadership. And in the fall, I am teaching a World Civilization I class, which I'm just so excited about because I love talking about ethics. I love talking about leadership, but I love talking about history. I love talking about public governance. I love talking about all things social studies. And I, I'm so excited. I can't wait to go back in and have my students actually do some things that I, I really wish that as a 22-year-old teacher, I would have thought about this. Yeah. And instead of looking at the Stone Age from books, I'm going to have my students actually create a hand axe out of a rock because they wow. got to know 
what it was like to be a hunter gatherer. And I'm going to have them mummify a chicken to talk about Egyptians. Why? Because this is the stuff. It's not the textbooks. It's not the stuff in the library. If you are not, and, and I'm really hoping if there's a publisher out there, I'm writing a book called Integrating STEM in the Humanities. Because if you can experiment in history like you are in science and you do, um, one of the greatest shows I ever saw was on the British Broadcasting Company called Time Team, where archaeologists would go out for three days, they'd find stuff, and they'd always do experimental archaeology. So they would build things like an Iron Age pot for pottery, or they would build a hand axe, or they would build a... Um, a, a trebuchet. Could you imagine having students during the Middle Ages out in the back of your school and having them go, okay, guys, we're going to do some pumpkin stuff today. Let's see how far that thing flies. Science, math, engineering, history. You know, you could have the English teachers talk about how they could portray it. Have the French teachers teach them a little bit of French so they sound like they're actually at the medieval court even though we know that it's Middle Ages French, not really, but, you know, the artistry. I mean, you could do a major unit, and that's what I want people to do, is I want them to realize that schooling is not about worksheets. It's about experimentation. Yeah. Casey, you're so right, and your passion comes out. Man, I'd love to sit in your class and learn. Uh, you mentioned something that earlier in the conversation that I just want to go back to. Um, I've seen several times, I follow you on Twitter. Um, again, we follow certain uh, of the same people, and you talked about civics. And um, I know you were very passionate that we need to go back and talk about civics and teach our students civic. Let's go ahead and make a case for that. Why, why do you feel that we should be teaching civics in schools and high schools, especially like right now? Yeah, you know, coach, I think one of the areas we've lost the battle with is this idea of what is it? What it, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean? And right now what we do is we teach the mechanics, but we don't teach the dirt of civics the volunteerism, the getting in and being able to disagree without being disagreeable. And I also think we're putting way too much on schools because schools can only do so much. We've got to, as a society, get back to teaching civics. You know, we've, we've got to get back to companies saying, you know, this idea of working and squeezing a person until they're dead, that's an 1800s thought. What the heck, you know? And why haven't we held our leaders accountable? Why haven't we said enough's enough? I, I, my heart is so much in pain right now because of the anti-Asian American rhetoric I'm hearing, because of the gun violence. Those 20 angels in Connecticut who lost their lives because we've cut mental health because we've cut supports for family. I, in 1999, and I talk about this in my book, I was driving back to Fredonia from my first teaching job, and on the radio, they broke in and to talk about Columbine. My entire career has been one epic gun violent incident in schools. And you know, Coach, enough's enough. If we're not going to talk about civics, if we're not going to talk about civility, then we've lost the battle. And what's really crucial is not to teach students how to write a public policy analysis paper or how many justices are on the Supreme Court or how do you actually enact a senator. But we need to ask, why are people in Georgia saying you cannot give water to a voter. We need to ask why our leaders are telling women, no, you don't have control over your own bodies. We need to ask why people in public are willing to ensure that billionaires do not pay money into a tax system. 20% 
not paying into the American government. While we have people who aren't sure if they're going to be able to feed their families. This is not the country I'm proud of. I am proud of a country that says instead, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That is the America I want. Casey for president. I'm just going to say it right now. Uh, Casey 2049. No, 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 coach. No, Sarah, Sarah for president. There's been too many. Look, hey, listen. listen. I, I will back anybody's voice who wants to run. I will back anybody's voice because there are so many amazing POC scholars, underrepresented individuals out there. I will shut up and I will sit down to let the voices that deserve have the floor. But please know I will support and I will also learn. And so one of the points that I want to share with my friends, my listeners, my readers, is that if you don't at least once a week stop and say, oh, crap, I could have done that better. You're not a reflective educator. And I, I, I want to give a huge shout out to my wife, Elizabeth because she carries so much emotional labor and so much work of helping me be better day in and day out. And I need your listeners to understand and know, behind every author is not only an amazing person like Sarah, is amazing editors, our amazing friends like Melody and Mandy, who are part of our Edumatch family, but there's also suffering, long-suffering partners who are like, oh, crap, they're at it again writing. Because, right, we just, we, we got to get, something's up here and we got to get it out. But we got to share it. Yeah. Hey, man, I, since we're bringing up wives, I got to give my wife a shout out. Because for years, she has allowed me to spend money on things that I felt was important, like podcasting and the side eyes and the eye rolls that I've endured over the years. Uh, I got to give her, I got to give my wife a shout out. I love you. You have supported me always. And I really appreciate your support. Even now she is <laughs> taking care of, taking care of my son. Like right now, she's probably, uh, smiling. Hey baby, it's me. I'm on. Yeah. And, you know, I got to tell you, I wrote my book about my mom and dad and, you know, I dedicated a chapter to them. Um, my my parents went through a lot. We 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 had life easy, you know, because we were middle class. We had to struggle to get there a few times. But growing up, I did not want for food. I did not want for clothing. I did not want for adventure. So, you know, Without my mom and dad sacrificing, I don't think I ever would have done this. And, you know, when my mom and dad got their autographed copy of the book, I had page marked it where I quoted the amazing artist who says, thank God for mom and dad sticking two together and teaching us because we don't know how. Right? You hear it with the outcast quote? Yep. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now I, I grew up in suburban Buffalo. I am a Bill Collins, John Bon Jovi guy. No more after the Bills, though. Right? Yeah. My mom and dad thought that that was beautiful poetry I wrote. And then my sister showed them the Outcast music video. And my mom was in tears because she was like, oh, that made you think of us. And I'm like, yup. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's funny. That's hilarious. Hey, uh, Casey, where uh, where can our listeners find you at? So the best place to find me is, of course, thinking about teaching on Amazon. Please get that book. And if you direct message me, I will uh, appear for your faculty, staff meetings, PLCs, PLNs. I like to do it. I'm also at KCJ underscore edu on Twitter. I've got a uh, Weebly website. CTJ Solutions LLC. Uh, I'm always on LinkedIn. I'm always on Facebook. I'm all over the place. I, you know, I'm all over the place. 
just get with me because at the minimum, I'll make you laugh. I may make you laugh with me. I may make you laugh at me. I may make you laugh behind my back, but at least I'm going to make you laugh. Yeah, yeah. Most definitely. I appreciate you coming on. Hey, man, I want to thank you for taking time to come on the show and I will be getting back with you. But thank you so much for coming on the show and taking the time to work with me uh, as we tried to get you on. Coach, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I give you mad props, man. Being a school leader under these circumstances, I mean, you know, not only have you faced a major pandemic, you faced increased state standards. You faced personal profession. I mean, oh my gosh, you deserve an extra Saturday. You really- <laughs> I think we all do, brother. I think we, we all do. <laughs> we all do. Hey, Amen. I appreciate you coming on and you have a great day. Thanks. You too, coach. All right, man. So that's the audio portion of it. Hey, dude, I really appreciate you coming on. You're an amazing guest. You're welcome. My wife, hey, look, my wife came in. She was like, your mic is muted. It sounds muffed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to tell you. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it's great. It's great. Yeah. God love them all. Yeah, love them all. So she's coming in. I'm, I don't know if you can see, but I'm like. <laughs> well, the, the dryer beeped, right? I'm thinking, yeah. oh, crap. I forgot. I totally forgot. No, but, you know, again. <laughs> My Elizabeth stayed upstairs because she's she knows I've been I've been doing a couple of podcasts. I've been getting on lately. I was with Melody on Saturday morning. So yeah. on uh, on Teachers on Fire, man, you know I tell you all to think because Doctor Sarah said I got to get these voices out there. You know yeah. she is a true hero. She, yeah, she really truly is. is, truly is, man. And I surely appreciate your voice. So um, I know you're writing another book. So when you finish that book, sir, uh, the cog in the machine, did I yeah. say that right? All right. Yeah. Hey, man, I, when that comes out, I want to get you back on. And if any way I can work with you, then just let me know. Um, you know, it's yeah, all good. And I, I appreciate it. Now I just, you know, I, I want to find a home for the book I'm writing about combining steam in the humanities you know yeah, i i love yeah. edge match i really do but yeah. you know i was talking with with mandy and melody they're just they're just flat out overwhelmed they're yeah. they're they've got publication coming out like new publication two to three a month for the next three years so wow. you know uh, yeah because they're they're acquisitioning a ton of books you know and i, I was saying we you know we got to start getting like Co- like boxes where if we go to conferences yeah. setting up tables and you know not only selling our book but selling like the entire load yeah. because there's just so many great authors out there so yeah you guys are really doing it big man i show i i can i'm only envious man i can only right now i only got a bandwidth for a podcast so um <laughs> maybe one of the one of these days these episodes will turn to a, a couple pages but Hey, man, my hat's off to you guys. I know you working hard and very passionate about what you do, man. I love talking to you. I love seeing you around. So, man, I just appreciate you coming on. Do you want me to do a presentation to your staff for a staff development day? You know what? If I was in charge of that, I'd definitely have you and a couple different people. So, oh, but yeah. I definitely will keep you on the list, most definitely. Like, uh, yeah. I-, I would definitely pass you on. And then to a couple yeah. other people. Are you familiar with uh, Dr. Josue Falis? No, I'm not. Okay, he's in Edgy Match too. Um, you guys, um, he does a uh, GOMO G O M O um, services, and I think you would fit in with that as well. So, but he's another Edgy Match guy too. So, um, I will probably you know introduce what, on Twitter in just a second. And you know what's great, Coach, is that uh, with us not being able to travel because of COVID, it really cuts down on the expenses. Yeah, you know, yeah. just, just popping somebody on for a Zoom for thirty minutes is super inexpensive compared to having them fly hotel you know and uh but no i mean just you know let let whoever's in charge of that know i'm available and you know you you can you can get the friends and family discount through edge of match so (laughs) casey i sure appreciate it i will keep you on hey man i sure appreciate you coming on you have a great day okay you're welcome last last thing i wanted to say to you you know how you get the podcasts on the paper Yes, sir. Just do, huh. a, just do a dictate of a uh, voice to text. 
you're right. You're right, sir. Because you know how my book started? It was me, me blogging. I just copied the blogs down. Wow. Yeah. And I, I mean, Sarah helped me move through them and make them better. But honestly, this started as a blog. Mm, okay. So All right. Voice to text, and you'll, hey, you'll, you'll be published by this time next year. Hey, man. So uh, I need a foreword from you then if you if you will write me a foreword. Deal. Deal. <laughs> hey, I sure appreciate you, Brady. Take it easy, man.